Let me just officially welcome you then to our third sensory session of the year where we'll be talking about co-fermentation. In just a couple minutes, I'll um, welcome in our two experimenters for the day, Don Stein from Duquesne Winery and Michael Henney from Michael Schaps Wineworks. But before I do that, I'm just gonna give a very quick update or a very quick um, introduction to some of the topics that we'll be talking about throughout our time together today. So when we talk about co-fermentation, we're just talking about the simultaneous fermentation of two or more varieties in the same vessel. A lot of times we, we um, pay a lot of attention to kind of the ones where we have red, red varieties and white varieties fermented together because those have a particular interest. But really, if we have two white varieties together or two red varieties together, it still counts as co-fermentation. There's a couple of just really famous examples of wines that do result from co-fermentation or at least have historically. The Cote Roti wines from the Northern Rhone um, historically have been a co-fermentation of Syrah with Viognier. Um, that Viognier might be between five and 20%, five and 10% is more usual, but there are some examples that go as high as 20% of Viognier. Chianti was, um, was traditionally actually a blend uh, or a co-fermentation of Sangiovese with small amounts of a native Italian red variety, as well as Trebbiano and Malvasia, which are both white varieties. So when, when I think about co-fermentation, I always kind of think, well, why didn't you just blend it? Like the co-fermentation sort of makes you, gives you less control in some ways. So why do co-fermentation instead of blending? And it turns out there's a few reasons why. Um, when you sort of read about these, these, these uh, historic blends that have been done by co-fermentation, a lot of times the first reasons that you'll get will just be aroma or flavor enhancement, which is something that we could theoretically be getting by blending. Um, a lot of times the language talks about sort of lifting and textural softening. And again, that's a lot of times what we think about if we're gonna add a little bit of white in with a little bit of red. But some of our historic co-fermentations are really just an artifact of, of the history of the vineyard itself. So we have to remember that we didn't always have nurseries that were going to grow up a particular clone from an embryonic cell and give us you know, something to graft onto selected rootstock in a lot of cases. When folks were going out to rogue their vineyards, they were just planting what they had available to plant at the time. Uh, one example I came across was the Buckland Vineyard, which is in California. It's currently owned by Ridge. Um, it's one of these really old Zinfandel vineyards in California. Um, they went through and by ampelography, they looked at all the different varieties in there a couple of years ago. And what they found was that they actually had 16 different varieties um, that had been interplanted in this vineyard over the many years that it's been in existence. Some of those make sense for what you might be blending with Zinfandel anyway, so Morvedra, Petit Syrah, uh, Syrah itself, but some of them are probably not things that you would intentionally be blending in there like French Columbard or table grapes. Um, but those are just things that have now become resident in this vineyard. And to honor their own terroir and the heritage of the vineyard, Ridge just does a big pick of the whole thing and ferments it together under the label of the Buckland Ranch wines. Um, but one other thing that people will talk about with co-fermentation, and I think maybe the biggest argument for co-fermenting versus blending, is this idea of color enhancement through co-pigmentation. Um, and this is the kind of thing uh, there's, there's a sort of a vast literature with deep phenolics in here. I'm going to give you just a really quick um, overview of what this is. If you want more details on these, I'd be happy to, to point you to some papers that give a little bit more detail on this. But the idea of co-pigmentation really rests on the idea that anthocyanins, our primary red pigment, they're not really stable um, in, our, in our wine matrix. They're prone to bleaching and oxidation and absorption if they're not associated with something else. So we do see that, for example, the anthocyanins will sort of reach a maximum sometime during, during fermentation, and then they'll sort of start going away because we lose them to these various processes. But they don't they can associate with other factors. So they can associate with themselves, but they can also associate with these molecules called cofactors. And those are just monomeric phenols that are in the, in the wine matrix um, from, from various different parts of the grape. Um, but what they do is sort of by some chemical processes they're not entirely sure of, but hydrophobic interactions and some, some uh, steric interactions, they sort of form these kind of stacks where you'll kind of have your cofactors and your anthocyanin is just kind of pancaking on top of each other. What that does in terms of helping with the color of the wine 
um, is a couple of different things. The first thing is just sort of helping to get more extraction of anthocyanins. So the anthocyanins themselves, when they're coming out of the skins of your grapes, they go into the solution, but then they sort of eventually get this equilibrium where they're coming into solution and then they're absorbing back onto the skins of the grapes or the yeast cells themselves. And so there's a certain, there's sort of a, a saturation effect essentially. If they sort of start to assemble into these cofactors, then it kind of makes more room in the solution itself for more anthocyanins to come out of those cells and be in solution. So this stacking sort of helps to, helps to extract more out of the skins itself. The other thing is, is that our anthocyanins take on lots of different forms in solution, only some of which have, a, have red color to them. But when they're found in the stacks, it stabilizes the red colored form as opposed to some of the non-colored forms. It also sort of shifts the wavelength just a little bit so that the color is a little bit bluer than the, the red that you get when it's just free in solution. Um, and it turns out that when, when they sort of looked, they, when they looked at sort of how much color you would expect from this amount of anthocyanin, um, when you had anthocyanins plus cofactors, you had almost 50% more color in the wine because of these, this sort of process of, of amplifying the, the color in the anth anthocyanins that you have. The other thing is, is that we said that, you know, we lose our anthocyanins over time and this stacking or co-pigmentation that helps to protect those anthocyanins from some of those processes that would leave, that would make them sort of lo lost sooner. The other sort of sensory thing that, that came out when I was reading this review paper was also that the cofactors themselves would normally, some of those cofactors could, could um, have the sensory component of bitterness or astringency, but when they're stacked in co-pigmented stacks, they maybe are not quite as bitter or astringent. So in addition to having this sort of effect of the color shift with co-pigmentation, we may also have a little bit of shift in terms of bitterness and astringency. So the idea of sort of why do co, why does, what does this have to do with co-fermentation? All of our red wines have a certain amount of this going on. The amount of anthocyanins we have are enough that they would participate in these stacks either way. Um, the, the difference is, is that some of our varieties have more of these cofactors and some have less of these cofactors. So if you have a low cofactor, yeah, a low cofactor variety, you may be able to co-ferment it with a higher cofactor variety and be able to keep some of these anthocyanins along the way and therefore improve your color. So like I said, that's sort of the back of the envelope version of that. There's a lot more chemistry that goes into it as you can imagine. But for today, we'll sort of leave it at that and kind of jump into what we've got for our, um, oh, I'm sorry, I've got one other thing about that. So there's all this chemistry to it, but what does that look like in real life? Does it really work? So there are a couple of studies that have looked at this. The review paper I read basically said that the formal studies are sparse with inconsistent results, which was very helpful as you can imagine. So some of the results that this, this paper went over though, there was a study looking at Sangiovese with Trebbiano and Malvasia where they did find this enhancement of color through co-pigmentation. There was another study though, looking at Tempranillo and Viura, which is a white Spanish variety. And this would be a co-fermentation you would find in, in some old Riojas that they did not find any color enhancement. And the Syrah Viognier pairing, at least in, that, in the particular study that was being reviewed here, also did not find color enhancement. So, and then there was one other study I looked at, which is a little bit peripheral to this, but we often here in Virginia, one of our sort of least color stable wines would be some of our red hybrid wines like our Chamberson. Um, and probably because we're not getting some as much sort of long-term polymerization of our anthocyanins. So I did see one study looking at a hybrid Marquette with co-fermentation with a Vitus vinifera species with the idea of trying to increase um, some of the cofactors that direction. And it turns out that the things that would lead to color instability in the Marquette sort of, the, the negative effect of the Marquette was higher than the positive effect of the Cabernet Sauvignon, such that if they sort of even did a 50-50 blend, that they had lower color and lower tannin than what they expected to have. And what they found there is that basically in that case, it would have just been better to blend and they actually compared it to the blended wine. Okay, so with all of that, let's jump into the experiments that we have today. Well, so uh, I'm gonna- Joy, can I make a comment before sure. you go on to the wines? Uh, a couple of comments relative to Virginia. 
Uh, one of the reasons why the literature is somewhat confusing is because, or contradictory, I should say, is because uh, different uh, grapes have different phenols, of course, and different degrees of oxidation. These cofactors oxidize pretty readily. Uh, the most important cofactor for Virginia wines are probably the flavanols. And flavanols are, are the red, uh, particularly red grape sunscreen, and they're, they're in only small amounts, but if you want to increase the, the uh, cofactor concentration, if you're dealing with a variety that has a low color, low anthocyanin concentration, if you, pro if you have a little bit more sun exposure, you're going to increase the flavanol content. That's a certain kind of a phenol, and that can be responsible for as much as 30% uh, wow. color, color amplification. And the other thing to consider is one of the most important cofactors uh, is arginine. Arginine, of course, is an amino acid, the prominent amino acid. And if you want to you want to get a, a good visual understanding of really what this whole idea of co-pigmentation is. Take a look at your, your must right pre-fermentation and, and clarify it, evaluate the color, and then watch that color change during fermentation. You know, the color will end up diminishing. And we always thought that that was a function of simply the... Um, absorption of color by the yeast, but really the arginine is used by the yeast. The arginine is a very strong cofactor and you are eliminating that cofactor and therefore eliminating this co-pigmentation. And you can see a very vivid example of co uh, reverse co-pigmentation right uh, before your very eyes. But I guess the most important thing about this is to remember that um, while anthocyanins are important, cofactors are equally important because, as you point out, it can be as much as amplify the, the color by as much as 30, 50 percent. That's a thank you, Bruce, for that. I, that I, the arginine portion of that is something I hadn't heard before, and it's that makes a lot of sense for why we would have that diminishment. And that seems like something we could easily do and sort of do a set of pictures and then share that with everybody. So we'll try to get that set up for the next yeah. for next. Yeah, year. it is kind of fun. I mean, because it this whole deal uh, operates in what's referred to as Bear's Law, which says there's a, a, a positive correlation between the concentration of an anthocyanin and the color. When you add the cofactor, there isn't uh, that that re linear relationship changes dramatically. Uh, to enhance color. Right. And so it can be a big deal. Although, again, let me say that uh, how you manage the vineyard and which cultivars we're talking about makes a big, big difference. Right. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Bruce, for that. That was very, very interesting. So, okay, so let's go ahead and jump into our experiments for the day today. So um, I'm going to invite uh, Don Stein and, and Michael Henney. We'll sort of talk about these somewhat together. So Jenna, if you could spotlight the two of them, I think that will bring them to sort of the front of everybody's screen. Um, so we will start with, with Don's experiment today, and that was flight one of your tasting. So as we're sort of jumping in here, if you want to, if you haven't already poured your glasses, you can kind of do that as we're, as we're going. I don't see Don yet. Jenna, do you have Don? I'm actually having a hard time finding Don. Where did you go? Don. Don, can you unmute yourself? Are you here? Is she? I, I can't see. My screen is up, so. I'm not seeing Don on the call. Uh, and it's, sometimes the connectivity there is a little weak, so. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm wondering if we can switch flights. Maybe we can switch. We can switch sides and see what happens. This could be fun. Um, Michael, why don't we, we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about your experiment first and then we'll come back and hopefully Don will be able to come back on. Does that work? Okay, that, that, that works just fine. Unless you want me to just kind of talk about the Duquesne part some, but either way. Um, 
Well, actually, yeah, why don't we go ahead and just because of the flight order, we don't want to get people confused. So since you were you were a consultant on this project, then maybe we can jump in and hopefully John will come back and, and, and join us soon. So the so this was an experiment with um, with Syrah at Duquini. Let me come backwards there. So Michael, tell us a little bit about if what you know of, of this of the Syrah at Duquini and, and what it's like to, to grow Syrah here in Virginia. Sure. So um, Don, Don and I have been working together at Duquesne, uh just a short, short time since uh, 2020. So we're both relatively uh, new, new to the vineyard. Um, the, I know in 2019, uh, Rosé was, was made out of it, but I, I wasn't so familiar what had been done with it uh, pre previously, but I'd had an extensive experience working with both uh, Syrah and Merved and some other Rhone varietals in Virginia um, from my, my years at Horton Vineyard. So I had, um, you know, kind, kind of during that time with both, both of those varietals, we were oftentimes able to achieve a very kind of like, kind of pr pretty delicate fruit forward wine, but certainly not, not to be confused with anything from the Northern Rhone in the case of Syrah or from further south, or uh, you know, in, in Spain, with a case of Merved or Mataro. So uh, I was oftentimes looking for a bl blending component um, to you know, try, try, try to try to get get a bit bit more out of it. Um, and I'd done a n n number of um, co fermentation co, co pigmentation trials with Syrah. And Viognier through the years, and um, certainly in all of my experiences, the uh, co color was a bit lower, so it wasn't you know we we weren't getting you know kind of that that elusive synergy that you hear about in the northern Rhone where it makes the the, the wine more more intense. Um, but yeah, yeah. So with with um, the Duquesne Syrah. You know, it was just kind of um, a neat way of exploring what what direction we wanted to go with this this product. Plus, the the, the lot was going to be about a three ton lot, and it, it was just the, the it made the math kind of easy to break break it into three three different uh, T bins where we could do a straight Syrah, we could do a portion of Viognier one, and see what happens if we push it. You know. I, I, it's pretty, pretty confident we go to sort of a lighter, more aromatic style, and then a bit of uh, to, to not in it to you know, maybe look, look for a little bit more in intensity to it. Um, and, and yeah, yeah may, maybe to address the qu question of you know why you know wh why why this just can't be achieved through blending. So what, why why you can't just make all the pieces separately and then blend, blend it up? So of course you you can do it that way, but I, I love the opportunity for during co-fermentation for the kind of lighter Syrah in the case of Tanat to be able to pull, you know, a, a, a little bit from those Tanat skins um, and pretty much the, the same, same case with Viognier. And, you know, also just the, you know, when we process, say, say Viognier, say for, for whole cluster pressing, we're, we're not really exploring much what's in those skins or seeds um, in the white wine making context. And when we put Viognier skins into a red uh, white wine making context, then, you know, we, we've got some temperature, we've got some length, you know, we're, we're exploring what's, what's in the skins and, you know, there, there's some uh, interesting aromas and textures in there that we don't really explore a whole lot in, in the white wine making context. So yeah, so that, that was some, some of the reasoning behind the, the experiment. Um, it, as it played out with, with the ripening, there were um, um, some lo logistical challenges that I hadn't anticipated when I was thinking about it. Um, just we, we had, um, you know, the Viognier had been picked a few weeks er earlier and we had uh, left a few panels out there and we're having a lot of animal pressure on those. So that, that, was, uh, that was challenging. And then the, uh, so as, so yeah, we ha had to ev eventually pick the Tanat and the VNE portion a little bit earlier and keep it on a reaper until the Syrah was as ripe as we could get it. So yeah, so that's, 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 that's a little bit of the background between the behind the trial. 
Yeah, and, and I realized as we sort of jumped in with you talking about this, others may not realize that you're the consultant at Duquesne and you were the one who actually recruited Dawn into this trial. And so you've been sort of working with her um, side by side on the trial. So you are very well versed in, in talking about it. So so just uh, when I was talking to Dawn about um, about this a couple of weeks ago about, you know, why VNA and, and why it's not, um, she did say something that I thought was really interesting. She said that, you know, there was some genetic work done a couple of years ago that that revealed this relationship between Syrah and VNA as well. So I went ahead and looked that up. I'm going to skip forward here. Um, so this was actually done in, in 2008, but um, in sort of using DNA technology to sort of resolve some of the relationships really between Mondius Noir and Mondius Blanche, it sort of revealed that Syrah and Viennier have this relationship that's that's pretty close. So right now, or at least at, at the time of this writing, this is this comes from Jansen's Robinson's wine grapes. Um, the they think that Syrah and Viennier would either be kind of half half siblings, so like a half brother, half sister, or that Viennier might be a, a grandparent of Syrah. So there is some sort of genetic relationship there. And I think Don also sort of liked the idea of bringing those two things together. So Don has come back and joined us. Thank you, Don, for coming back. We, <laughs> we, we just talked about Syrah and, and, and why co-fermenting with them. Um, with, with Viognier, and I was just talking about how um, we had talked about that genetic relationship. So, um, and, and so where that sort of lands everything right now is kind of, you know, it, they're thought to be kind of part of that greater Pinot family, but like I said, Syrah and Viognier being um, siblings in that way. And then that brings us to Tanat, and Michael talked a little bit about Tanat already, but, um, you know, here in Virginia, Tanat's a really nice variety for us. In some ways, it gives us some good sugar accumulation. It gives us some really good color and some good astringency and some good tannin. It can tend to have high, high TAs. So if you're in a warmer region, that might be a good thing that it's retaining some of its acidity. If you're in a colder region, that might be a little bit more, um, more challenging to get it within a, within a, a TA that is, is sensorily um, uh, what you're looking for. But as a blending partner, um, it, it, it brings that to the party as well. Okay, so let's jump into to how things got set up. Um, so Don, are you back? Can you tell us how you set up your experiment? Oh, we can't hear you yet. Okay, looks like we still are having trouble hearing her. So I'll go ahead and explain how the experiment was and, and hopefully we can get there. So this was pretty straightforward in terms of proportion. So there was one T-bin that got Syrah only, one that got 85% Syrah and 15% Viognier, and one that got 85% Syrah and 15% Tanat. Um, if you wanna know sort of the specifics of what all happened during fermentation, Jenna's already put the draft reports into the, the chat so you can see what other winemaking was done along the way. Um, but um, so that you know what's in front of you, let me go ahead and tell you what's in front of you and then we'll jump into looking at what the chemistry is. So if you're in group one, if um, wine 857 was the Syrah Tanat co-fermentation, wine 418 was the Syrah Viognier co-fermentation, and wine 308 is the Syrah alone. If you're in group two, wine 409 is the Syrah Viognier, wine 296 is Syrah Tanat, and wine 584 is Syrah. If you're in group three, wine 228 is Syrah, wine 393 is Syrah Tanat, and wine 919 is Syrah Viognier. And if you're in group four, wine 144 was Syrah Tanat, wine 976 is Syrah, and wine 362 is Syrah Viognier. Um, so as, as Michael said, you know, one of the one of the difficulties here was kind of the logistics of having these things maybe not be ripe at the same time. So um, as Michael said, the, the Viognier was, was harvested, the main block of the Viognier was harvested on September 14. Um, they let this hang longer until about September 24th. Um, but Michael, you said it was mostly due to animal pressure that it was just time to sort of take that Viognier in and you couldn't hang it longer. Yeah, there, there's some animal pressure and some rock pressure and everyone knows like it's, it's like during harvest, there's a lot going on. So it was hard, it was hard to, you know, have attention brought, brought to that. So it was, so yeah, we just ended up getting it to a safe spot. Right. 
And the Tanat was, so So the, the remaining part of the Viognier and the Tanat were both harvested on September 24th. They were harvested into lugs and put in the reefer and then and then um, basically taken back out when the Syrah was harvested on, on October the 8th. So even though Syrah and Viognier might, might get ripe at the same time in, um, in, the, in the Rhone um, at Duquesne, it does not seem like they did at least this year. So that is one thing to be thinking about, again, with that, that logistics of co-fermentation. If we look at the, the basic chemistry of the juice itself, we do see that adding in that Tanat gave a little bit of a bricks bump um, and also brought down the pH just a little bit. Um, the VNA gave a little bit of a bricks bump, but not too much, um, and, and at least didn't negatively affect the pH too much. I usually think of VNA as a, as a tough one in terms of the pH, so that was good that it didn't do that. Um, the fermentation was good and robust. There wasn't anything about the fermentation that would make us think that what we see later um, was about, you know, having differences in the fermentation itself, so that's good for the experiment. Um, when you look at this particular slide, I know that there's a lot of data on this slide and I'll, I'll lead you through it. Basically for each one of our treatments, we ended up with three barrels of wine and we sampled those three barrel, all three barrels of, those, of that wine for general chemistry on January the 28th. Then we went back in the beginning at the end of February and just did a sort of double check of the chemistry of the barrel that we were gonna use for our sensory. So that's the, the February 25th one there. Now, a couple of things here, you will see our barrels um, in the Syrah only, we had all 2019 barrels. In Syrah Viena, we had all 2018 barrels. In Syrah Tanat, we had a, a blend of those. So we just need to keep that in mind as we sort of evaluate the results from the Syrah. Um, it, I'm sorry, we ended up picking the 2018 barrels for Syrah Viena and Syrah Tanat, and we ended up taking the 2019 barrel for Syrah only. Um, they were still relatively neutral, but we just need to keep in mind that one, that one barrel was a little bit younger. Um, we do see we have a little bit higher volatile acidity in the Syrah Tanat. Um, it's, it's not a lot, but it is a little bit, um, and it is something that we see pretty much in each of the barrels, so that was something that probably came out of fermentation and wasn't just a barrel effect. Um, the pH that bump that we got from Syrah Tanat doesn't really seem to be meaningfully different once we get into the wine stage. Um, but what is meaning, what, what did, did sort of happen there, these were all chapitalized at the same rate and that bricks bump that we got from the Tanat did translate into a little bit higher alcohol um, in the finished wine as well. Um, when, we, when we were thinking about uh, co-fermentation, we did talk about, about the effect on color. So we did wanna make sure to look at color, but we have to be careful when we interpret our numbers for color. Color is affected not only by um, you know, the anthocyanins themselves, but all these cofactors that we were talking about, but also other factors like pH and SO2. So we just saw that the pHs are pretty much the same. And what I did here when I, when I plotted all of this is I just put the free sulfur numbers at the time that, that the data were taken. That's those numbers on the end caps there. So we can see in our Syrah only, um, we have a little, bit, a little bit more color intensity than in our Syrah Viognier. There is a little bit difference in our SO2 rates there, but actually the fact that this SO2 normally would make them more SO2 would diminish the color more. So if those were evened out, we would anticipate that we would actually have a little bit lower color in the Syrah Viognier. So it does look like we're having some dilution um, by putting that white wine into the red wine. And our Syrah Tanat does have um, a considerably higher color intensity to it. Um, and again, our SO2 numbers aren't exactly the same, but they're, they're pretty close enough to each other to say that we probably do, did pick up some better color from that, um, that, co that co-fermentation with the Tanat. When we looked at the phenolics of these, we did get a number for total anthocyanins. They sort of followed that same trend that we saw for the color itself with the Syrah Viognier having less and the Syrah Tanat having more. Again, that probably just has to do with what those different um, different varieties are bringing to the party. Our polymeric anthocyanins, so those are the ones that have been um, that have been uh, bonded to tannins, are sort of our, our longer term, more stable anthocyanins. They're following that same trend as are the tannins. Um, so in this case, they sort of are, are all saying, you know, the Syrah Viognier has a little bit a bit a little bit less of all of those things. The Syrah Tanat has a little bit more of all of those things. Um, uh, so, but the most important thing there, again, as Michael was saying, is just really what is that going to be doing with our, to the sensory. So just to sort of review with you, if you need to take one more look at what you've got in the glasses in front of you, there's this, and then let's go ahead and if you will, um, go ahead and turn your cameras back on and I will stop sharing my screen. 
we go. Stop sharing my screen so that we can talk about um, the sensory effects here. So let's see. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay, so the first thing, if you guys could go ahead and, and, and turn on your cameras, because I need you to, I'm going to ask you to show me how different the wines were using your actual hands. So I need to, I need to be able to see your hands. So the first question is, how different did you feel like these wines were from one another? So we'll start with the Syrah Viognier. Um, if you can just hold up and tell me if you felt like the Syrah Viognier, if versus the Syrah, if it was not different at all, that's going to be one. If it was very, very different, that's going to be five. Okay, so just sort of hold up your hand and tell me how different did you feel like the Syrah was from the Syrah Viognier? So one to five. Everyone has to vote. Okay, I see lots of middle of the ground threes here. Two, three, three, okay. All right, so what was different between, so those, those of you that, um, oh, and then Horton says three, so th thanks, Caitlin. Um, so how, what was different between the wines? What were the main differences that you were picking out between the, the, the Syrah and the Syrah Viognier? If you can unmute yourself, that would, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and just speak in. I mean, for me, I, I would say that um, there was a little more aggressiveness in the tannins with the Syrah and the Tanat and the, and the Viognier had a little softness to it, a little more freeness okay. to it. Um, okay. I liked it. I mean, I definitely liked it. Okay. Okay. Other differences between the Syrah and the Syrah Viognier? Uh, Joy, I, th I think for, for, for me, um, I've got sort of a pleasant uh, Viognier aroma on the Syrah Viognier. Like it, it was, it wasn't too much, but it was, it was just kind of an interesting little footnote in there that I, I, I liked. I, li I, I liked I could recognize it, but it wasn't over the top. Okay. Little Viognier. Was it more about the, like the fruity part of the Viognier or the flowery part of the Viognier or just all of uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say sort of like a, a, a flowery kind of like a hint, hint of honeysuckle, that kind of Viognier honeysuckle, uh, maybe orange peel note in there. And yeah, so I, I just kind, kind, kind of like that, that I could recognize it, but it wasn't, the, the whole wine wasn't all about that note. Right. Yeah, I think for me, I, I had a note, it was like, there's almost a, a little bit of a spice component. And I think for me, that goes into like, that orange peel, nutmeg, there's just a little something there. And I, I, I found that pleasant too. Okay, what about the difference between the Syrah and the Syrah Tanat? So how different was the Syrah from the Syrah Tanat? Same thing, one to five. Syrah versus Syrah Tanat. Joy says a four, four, a little bit more different, okay. Syrah versus, hey, okay, four. Wow, a little, so a little bit more different there. All right, I see lots of fours, three, Okay. We've got so, some, so chat as well. We've got a two, a five, and a four. Okay. A two, a five, and a four. Okay. So, of those, so what was the main difference there for you guys? We had big numbers there. So, so Tim oh. Gorman's aroma. So, Tim, can you tell us what about the aroma seemed different? As he's typing back in, if he's as he's finishing his typing, if he's working on that, if you if anyone else has something to add there, other differences. I thought that the biggest differences in the entire experiment was just the color, the intensity, and the hue that we got, and that was the biggest player on this. The Syrah Tanat for me uh, versus the Syrah. Uh, I also got that it had different fruit profiles. I got more black and stewed characteristic as opposed to. Um, the blue fruit and um, some red raspberry fruit that I was getting in just the straight up Syrah variety that was kind of not there or masked by some of those bigger fruit characteristics in the Syrah Tanat. Yeah. Although the tannin perception was different, 
and how it played in uh, and around the palette too. So picking up in different localizations at versus uniformity. Uh, the Surat Tanat had an over-encompassing Tana profile across almost the entire mid palette versus just on the peripherals in Surat. Great. Yeah, thank you, Shai. Yeah, and and Tim Tim says that he could almost um, guess the Tanat aroma. So as much as Michael was sort of recognizing the Viognier character of that of that side of it. Tim was, was seeing the Tanat side of that. And I will say that we kind of, I mean, this is a pretty fair amount. I mean, we have 15% in there, which is a little bit, it's on, it's not on the shy side of our cofer. We wanted to see the difference if it was there. So um, definitely. And, and I would say that for me, the astringency was pretty, um, seemed pretty different to me. So they did, that, that seemed to be a big difference. Other big differences any for anybody? Well, I have a question if I may. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> um, what yeast was used in this? And given that uh, each of these lots would have different phenols, um, that might make a difference. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So and, all and of that is it is in the in the report, but I'm pretty sure it was Syrah yeast, which is just it's one of the Scott Labs yeasts. All right. <clears throat> and the um, when was the phenolic assay done? Uh, that was done in February. So that was that was done just a few weeks ago. And I assume that because you didn't report it, you just looked at total polymerics. You didn't break it down. Yeah. Correct. Well, yeah. Thank you. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have a poll. So um, Jenna, if you could go ahead and launch the poll. Um, one of the, one of the things that Don and I talked about early on was, you know, wanting to maintain sort of Syrah character. Um, and, and as Michael said, you know, sometimes adding a little bit of a blender here or there might actually help us to achieve what we would be expecting from Syrah a little bit, um, a, a little bit more pronounced in a more pronounced way. So the first question is just one, which one of these did you feel like most mimicked what you would expect to have from Syrah? And then secondly, which one did you prefer? And Jenny, you can feel free to. Yeah, we have 17 out of 18 in, so let's go for it. All right, can everyone see the results except for Joy? <laughs> All right, so 65% of the people said Syrah. Um, and then we had a little bit more varied responses for the preference. So. 18% said Syrah only, 24% said the Syrah Viognier, and 59% said the Syrah Tanat. Wow, okay. So I guess that idea, thank you, Jenna. I guess that um, that idea of the, you know, the Viognier sort of showing itself in the Viognier co-ferment and the Tanat showing itself in the Tanat co-ferment, that makes sense that our Syrah was the, was the most there. So, um, so, um, but it, it's interesting to me that the Syrah Tanat was the preferred one. So somebody who preferred the Syrah Tanat, tell us what you preferred about it. What was it about that one that you're like, yeah, this is, this is the best of the three. So I, 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 I was one of the people with, with the, the preference. Um, and I was also one of the people thinking that the Syrah Tanat was the most uh, Syrah like for me. Um, so, you know, I guess when we're, Talking about like Syrah, like are we talking about, you know, Paso Syrah? Are we talking about Cote Roti? There might be some different goals there. So I think when I think of Syrah, I think think of the North, Northern Rhone and I think like, okay, well, well, well if, if I'm aiming for that, I'm never going to be able to get there with just a straight Virginia Syrah. So I feel like that um, kind of 15% to not... Uh, pushes me a little more and what, what I think of those wines being like. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and Tim Gorman has just written and he said complexity and the near savory aroma and fruit flavor. And I think, yeah, we think about that savory character sometimes with Syrah that, um, that kind of does need a little bit more power to it to get there for sure. Okay. Other preferences, anybody want to defend your preference for either the Syrah or the, or the Viognier or not defend, but tell us what you liked about either the Syrah or the Syrah Viognier. I know there's not as many of you, but there were a couple of you. <laughs> so, so Dawn says that she likes all three of them blended. Um, so Dawn, if you wanna maybe put, type in there and tell us uh, what was it that you liked about all three of them? Unfortunately, Dawn doesn't have enough service to, to be able to, to give us a, a video or, or mic. So uh, we'll communicate this way. <laughs> I will say, I actually really liked the Strad Munier. I did think that it was, um, that it, I liked that sort of lift and spice character that came out of it. Um, yeah, so Dung comes back and she says the aroma and the complexity. So again, yeah, this, this is another way that we could be thinking about building complexity for sure. Well, okay, I, any I, other? I like, the, oh, I like the Viognier as well. I just like, I like the softness that the Viognier added to the Syrah. I mean, it, it was, you know, there was a, there was an elegance to the wine that I think was it was subtle. It wasn't quite as it wasn't quite as bold, and you got that. But there was just an elegance to the wine that I really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. And this is an early bottling, a relatively early bottling red. It's something that that probably does fit in that part of the of the thing as well. So, okay. Any other comments on this one before we move over to um, the next experiment? What one comment I would like to make is uh, no, no matter which your preference, everyone's a winner because uh, we're, we're doing three separate bottlings because each wine seemed kind of di distinct enough. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're going to bottle each is three. And that, that, that might be part of the reason that Don likes all three blended because it would be easier to just do one wine. <laughs> That's a good point. Hey, let's, let's talk. I, Michael, I would love to, to circle back to these and taste what they're like after a year. So let's, let's talk to you and I yeah, on and see if we're gonna extend this conversation. So, um, so Shai asks, has anyone taken co-ferment experimentation one step further fermenting juice of one red variety on skins of another? Actually, yes, Shai, we, we've done a number of those and actually we're about to talk about, um, about one of them in, in just a minute. So um, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll go into Michael's experiment and then we can come back and talk about that at the end as well, a little bit more. So, okay, so let me figure out how to do this again. Okay, so Michael, your experiment, we were looking at, um, Ferment, co-fermenting more ved, more vedra with tanat. So first of all, can can we can you see my screen? Does that work? Is it working properly? Okay, thank you, Jenna. Um, so tell us a little bit, Michael, about the more vedra that you're working with and why you wanted to um, utilize co-fermentation in this in this application. Yeah. So um, this this Marved is from Upper Shirley, um, j just to the east of Richmond, and it was an a uh, accidental planting, um, the winter of 2016 or 2017, there was, a, the cold, there was a cold winter in there and in their Tanat block they had, at the, at the low points, they had a lot, a lot of vines that were dyed. So they uh, re, re, replanted it with Tanat. Um, but then in the first vintage when the fruit was, was ripening, um, we're like, well, this, this is not to not um, something something different, and uh, it eventually ended up being identified as Merved, um, which was kind kind of a blessing in, in disguise because at Upper Shirley they uh, grow a lot of to not and Petit Verdot and make a lot of very you know intense, rich, extracted wet reds, and they were looking for kind of a softer, more fruit forward um, pr pr product, um, and then all, all of a sudden. There was this Merved to work with, so that that was that was kind of neat. Um, so um, kind of si similar to the Syrah, I'd say you know Merved on its own in Virginia can, in almost all, all the experience I, I've, I've had with it, it never gets really past sort of the medium bodied, uh, delicate, but but really with uh, you know a really beautiful bright hue to it, really pleasing crushed red fruit ar aromatics. 
uh, you know, no, 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 no pyrazine component. Um, so with uh, um, Taylo and T Taylo Jr. at uh, Upper Shirley, we kind of worked on the marketing goals of this wine. We thought that'd be fun to have a, an early to, to market red that was uh, bottled early to give some contrast uh, from some, some of the other uh, red, reds that they make. Um, but uh, with the pre previous two years, we had done some blending with Tanat to build up the body a little, give a little more color. So this was just a fun way to experiment of, you know, uh, what what does doing that during fermentation fermentation look, look like? So we did we did part of it just straight Merved and a part of it uh, with a Tanat component as well. So. This is not your, your first co-fermentation with Morved though, right? We, we did one last year, and this goes back to Shai's question, um, using Viognier skins. Um, you wanna tell us just a minute about what you thought about that wine when you co-fermented with the Viognier skins last year? Yeah, yeah, so with, um, you know, with the v Viognier skins, um, it, you know, I, I say it, it gave a, a little too much. I, I think that the, the Viognier aromas were, were a little too obvious and it added, you know, maybe perhaps some astringency to the wine. I, I, I can't recall, recall if, the, if the color dropped or not. It, um, you know, certainly the color didn't, didn't, didn't get, get any darker. Um, so, you know, I think kind of ha having, having learned from that experience, it seemed like that, that was the direction that we did, did, didn't want to go with, with that wine. And so, so we tacked in, saw what a Tanat component would do with it. So to answer your question about the color from last year. So last year we had two different barrels of, two different barrels of Morvedra only and two barrels of Morvedra Viognier. Um, and, and this is what the graph looked like. And when we saw this sort of second barrel of Morvedra Viognier, we were like, what happened there? So we looked back in the operations history and it had gotten topped with Tanat. Um, and so I think that was one of the things too that that you sort of were, were looking at already last year was like maybe this is something that that the Tanat is doing something that we wanted to do. So this is sort of more a, a more formal version of, of looking that, at that for sure. Um, let's see, I've lost my ability. So tell us how you set things up. Um, this yeah, yeah. So it was a pr pretty straightforward. We um, in the case of uh, Upper Shirley, the Tanat had not been harvested yet. So when we harvested the Merved, it was easy to, you know, ask them to pick, pick, pick a few lugs of, of Tanat so that we could ha have, have the two, two different trials. So um, yeah, yeah, de-stemmed de de to bin um, with, with both of them. And then in, in one of the tea bins had a 12% Tanat component. Yeah, so, so that you know what's in front of you. So this was a triangle test. Um, so if you're in group one, uh, wine 679 was the Morved on only. Wines 111 and 823 were the co-ferment of Morved and Tanat. If you're in group two, wines 996 and 627 were Morved only. And wine 710 was Morved Tanat. If you're in group three, wine 833 was Morvedra only. Wines 731 and 207 were Morvedra and Tanat. And if you're in group four, wines 617 and 440 were Morvedra only. And wine 705 was Morvedra Tanat. So um, we'll go through the chemistry first and then we'll talk about your sensory impressions of that. So um, as Michael said, I, the, you know, this one was a little bit easier in terms of the harvest timing. And I, I just sort of put this way over on the side here and I wanted to clarify what I mean by harvest date. When we saw the differences in timing in at Duquenne, I went back and, and asked Michael about um, what, the, what the timing of harvest was here. And the Morvedra and the, and the Tanat for the co-fermentation were, were all taken on um, September the 16th. The main block of Tanat was harvested on September the 20th. And so in that case, there wasn't a large um, difference in time there. Um, here we, we see relatively similar um, chemistries with, with, our, uh, with our fruit. I was, it, it does seem like there's a, there's a fair amount more yan in the um, Morvedra Tanat than in the Morvedra. I'm not, and, and, but Michael, you and I have talked about sort of the difficulties of measuring yans on, uh, on wines that were just crushed. So um, I don't want to read too much into that, but it was a little bit different. 
Um, in this case, there were actually two bins of Morvedra and one bin of Morvedra Tanat. Um, and we can see that um, we can see that the the Morvedra um, themselves sort of had a had a pretty steady fermentation. The Morvedra Tanat did get fairly warm and does seem to have stalled just so it sort of stalled out a little bit on, on September the, the 20th, it sort of changed its, its trajectory. And then everything was pressed on September the 23rd. And then this finished fermentation in the, um, that last little bit of fermentation in the, in the um, tank. So we did get a, you know, we did get a, a full fermentation there, but we, we do need to remember that the Morvedra Tanat just got a little bit more heat on it along the way. And that, that probably was just because of, you know, where it was in the, I don't know, Michael, if you have any ideas of why it was a little bit warmer. I, 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 know, I know there's a, a few uh, Wine Works alum on the line here and with, with our, with our set, set up with the tea bins, unfortunately, sometimes you might be in a bit more sun and sometimes in a bit less sun. Um, so it can be difficult to uh, control for that sometimes. So that's- Yeah, so that's, I, that's, I think that's it's that's unlikely right. that it was about the, the fruit itself. It's probably more a, a, a uh, artifact of production than about the to not causing it to be to be hotter in that sense. So um, in this case, we only had one barrel of each. It was one each barrel was sampled um, on January the 14th and then again on February the 25th. Um, and what we can see is that we did have slightly higher volatile acidity in the Morvedra to not. Again, that might just be because it got a little hotter and, and labored a little bit at the end. So that may have nothing to do at all with the co-fermentation. Um, we do see a little bit higher alcohol level in the Morvedra Tanat as well. Um, Michael, I don't know if you have any, any ideas. The, they, the chapelization rate was the same on both, um, on everything. So, and we didn't see a bricks, uh, bricks difference in the beginning, but again, did, I don't know if you saw any berry shrivel or anything like yes, that. In the, the, yeah, with the, with the um, uh, upper Shirley Tanat, um, there was definitely some significant barrel a bit very shrivel this year, and I, I, I know sometimes it can be really tough to get an accurate bricks reading on that. And uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we we had a false low bricks reading in the beginning on the Merved to not. Uh, so that that's that's kind of my, my thinking is due 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 to the rate rate reasoning of the Tanat berries that I'm, I'm I'm not kind of surprised to see that that might not have been reflected in the uh, the, the difference in the alcohol that might not have been reflected in the original bricks readings. Yeah. And I think that's one thing to think about with Tanat as a co-fermentation partner is that it does bring some natural sugar in with it. it we usually have really good sugar levels on Tanat and, and it, that might help some of these varieties that have a harder time accumulating sugar. So um, when we look at the color numbers here, the first time, again, we took samples on uh, January 14, those are the first two columns. And then again, on January 25th, the first time we took samples, we had fairly different SO2 levels. Um, and so we, when we, we got those relatively evened out before we took our second set of samples, we do see a little bit of difference in color here. Um, it does look like our, our co-fermentation does have a little bit more uh, color intensity. And again, that's what we would expect from that to not to bring us a little more color. When we look at the the phenolics, we can see that the Tanat just gave a little bump here. It wasn't giving maybe as um, as notable a, a difference as what we saw in the Syrah um, at Duqueney, but we do just see each one of these um, each one of these uh, numbers is a little bit higher in the Syrah Tanat. Uh, or, yeah, sorry, the Morvedra Tanat co-fermentation than what we see in um, in the in the Morvedra alone. Um, so again, just in case you need to refresh your memory of what's in front of you, but we're going to do the same thing we did last time. If you can go ahead and put your cameras back on, um, we will, I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. And we can jump into our discussion of the sensory components of this. <clears throat> so the first thing I would say is, is who was able to tell the difference between the wines? If you, if you're able to just sort of put your hand up. Were you able to tell the difference in the triangle test? And just remembering that if you were not able to tell the difference, that's not a wrong answer. That just tells us that the difference is slight. So don't feel bad if you couldn't tell the difference. This is actually how we figure out if it was different or not. So if you could tell the difference, if you could go ahead and raise your hand. Um, Mark also has it. Okay, so I see some hands up in the, in the chat as well. So we've got lots of hands up. So for those of you that were able to tell the difference, what was different? 
that that you were what what was the thing that that or what were some of the things that helped you to see the difference in those lines? I think the tannin structure mainly. You could sense it in the in the one that had the tannin in it versus just the Morvedra. Okay. Was it mostly just about amount of tannin, or was it uh, was there sort of a difference for you in the type of, of what you were picking up there? No, I, th I mean I think it was a there was a grippier tannin with the uh, with I mean the the, the grippy tannins that's not definitely made it into that blend, and you could you could tell. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other differences. Um, I, I, I was getting a little bit of a petiance, pet, a little bit of CO2 in the um, Morved to not that, that I wasn't in the baseline. Um, and actually when, when Jenna was out pulling the sample, I, I got really worried because there, there was positive pressure in the barrel. Um, so I was re re really worried about a uh, kind of the, be the beginning of a Britannomyces contamination. So we, we did a kytosan add to those two 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 barrels just because I, I don't don't want bread, bread in this wine so um so, so yeah sorry I was I was I was pick up on some co2 in there and and very concerned about it so. yeah yeah and thanks for bringing that up I didn't notice any in my sample but um but it might have to do with how you know the the bottle itself so um uh, so Tim Gorman says that uh more body sweeter sensation in the co-fermentation so again that that um, some of that body and the sweetness may be coming from that additional alcohol that we see in there, um, and or maybe just some of that concentration that comes from the tannin. But that alcohol, that increased alcohol level, can sometimes give us a little bit more perception of body and sweetness. Okay, other differences between? Did anybody notice the color between the wines? No. I to me. So Sharon, tell us what did what what was different for you in the color? You're nodding your head. Yeah, I definitely picked up on a darker color to it, a richer tone to it. Um, I'd also gave it some a coffee or caramel, tobacco, all on the on the nose. And for me, mm -hmm. it the Tanat gave it a, um, um, a it changed the the fruit character from more of a like a Bing cherry to more of like a black cherry. Just overall richer and more body to it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I, I agree with that. I really felt like it when Michael and I first started talking about this, he, one of the things that I wrote down in, from one of our conversations was that you were really looking to sort of shift that fruit character a little bit into a little bit more um, of that, that uh, less a, away from the sort of bright red kind of thing to a little bit more of that darker, um, more brooding. And I felt like it, I felt like the Tanat did that, um, at least from what I was perceiving, so. Okay, other, other differences that you picked up? Picked up I think a little we have bit. A... Yeah, go ahead, Jack. I picked, no, I picked up a different different sensation in the finish. Um, the Muvedra had more of just like a, a light alcohol and citrus tail to it. And then the co-ferment was a little bit more uh, red fruit, finished red fruit and a little bit warmer, uh, which plays into the alcohol content you have that increase one almost half percent uh, which was nice and then also it elicited different salivary responses too so i was my in the muvedra i was salivating less than i was in the in the co-ferment which was really weird to be okay. in tune with that interesting interesting okay okay so i i think we do have well, uh, bruce just said that that he's gonna have to leave us so thank you so much bruce for coming it's great to see you um, I think we, we are getting close here to, to wrapping up. We do have a, uh, another poll to see what your preference was. So if you can go ahead and, and fill out the poll for your preference. You know, Joy, I yeah, I would like to see a third trial in that where you um, do a blending of the same amounts of the co-ferment, but actually do the finished wines and blend them. That's what I want to see the difference in. I think that's a good point, Joyce. And it's funny because as I was I was preparing for the session, I was like, we should have done the blend too. <laughs> um, so I okay, think, I think you're thing. exactly right there. So 
because because that seems like the second question, right? Is is it worth it to co-ferment, but also do we get something from co-fermentation that we're not just getting straight from blending? So mm -hmm. if anybody would be interested in doing that trial, I would be happy to to discuss that with you. Michael, you had uh, your uh, so so jo Joyce, I would say one challenge of um, that though we did make um, straight upper Shirley to not. Um, just the way we made it was like more extractive. It was a, a tank fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was some uh, post fermentation maceration. So, just the, the 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 goal from the beginning was very very different on the two different wines. So, just uh, we we would have to, to for for it to, for it to be you know tr I guess tr tr truly valid. We'd have to be in a situation where we, where we would ch change the the wine making goal on the varietal to not. So that, that, yeah, that, that's, that's that's really good. yeah, that's a really good point. And, and too, I think, you know, when we're thinking about, for example, the Viognier, like, you know, Viognier fermented on its skins in a red wine ferment is very different than what you're just going to be doing for, for your regular Viognier. Um, but it, I think it's still an interesting question to say, like, you know, what does that look like? But realizing that it's probably going to, some of those differences are, are going to be because of winemaking. So. So how are we doing, Jenna, on our poll? Yeah, so we had 62% of participants prefer the co-ferment and 38% prefer the Mouvedre only. Okay. So how about somebody who preferred the Mourvedre only? Tell us what did you like about the Mourvedre only? Uh, so so I, 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 I was one with that pre preference and I just love the kind of the softness, fruitiness of it, and uh, the, the, ar the aromas. Um, and it, it's, it's gonna be er early, early, to, early to bottle, early to, to release red with a kind of fun, playful uh, lit label on it. So yeah, I, f I felt like um, just it, it, it was a little more pl playful and fun. fun. So that, that's why I preferred it. Anyone else who, who preferred the, the Morvedra? What about the other one? Somebody who preferred the more Vedra tonight. Tell us what you liked about that one. That's um, for me. It was the taste and smell of chocolate. I mean, if when I when that hits my nose for any wine, I'm going to be in heaven. <laughs> so, and then I'm going to go look for chocolate to go with it because I just <laughs> love that. And uh, so I, I really like that. And it of course made it easy for me to distinguish which one was not uh, did not have the chocolate. So, <laughs> okay. So it just had one of your favorite smells and flavors. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Other things that people liked about the, the co-ferment. I felt like it had, again, I, it, it sort of had a spice care. It was a little different than the spiciness that we got from the, the Viena, which was more sort of fruit spice. But this sort of, to me, had kind of some baking spices. Maybe that goes along with Joyce's chocolate. Um, but I, I kind of liked that, that additional complexity to it. But I have to say, I think I, if I had to choose, I might be with you, Michael, in that like, I kind of liked the, for what this wine is supposed to be, I think it, it, it did a nice job just as, it's, as itself as well. So um, any other comments or questions about these particular wines? And then maybe we'll pick up, we have, a, we have a, a general question in the chat and then we can get back to Shai's question about skins as well. Um, so uh, Wendy's asking, would the co-ferment age longer? Right now, I preferred the more Vedra only. Um, what do you think about that, Michael? Well, I'm, I'm really curious about that because I, I must say in some of the um, Mervedras I made at uh, Horton, um, so sometimes I'd be shocked. I have the, like this beautiful bright color coming out of the fermenter. And I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. And then um, about two months later, it'd be like, man, what happened to all the color? So I, I, I feel like I've, I've had some experience with that particular grape lo losing its color in a more dramatic way than I've than I've seen el elsewhere. So yes, yeah, so I, I was I was really curious on, on one of your slides. There seemed to have been uh, just a slight color drop on the straight Merved or um, over, over you know a one or two month period. So I, I would I would be curious over over time if that would 
um, become more uh, more more pronounced. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the confuse the I, I know what you're meaning in that slide. I think there there we have time, but we also have a difference in SO2. So it's hard to we had more SO2 in the second one. So it's hard to know how much of that was SO2 and how much of that. But that gets back to that idea of cofactors, right? If you don't have enough cofactors holding your anthocyanins, you're more likely to get them to drop out. So um, so that's that's a good point. Other questions or comments about this, about these wines before we I actually have a question both for Don and for Mike. Um, Don, if you can't if you can't get to Mike, maybe you can um, put it in your in the chat. But I guess I'm curious what you want to do with these wines next year. So you know, when you're making your Syrah or your Morved next year, where where do you think what uh, will you be co-fermenting? Do you want to try something else, or are you just sort of happy with where it is at this point? So Don says the Syrah will be rosé, <laughs> um, and it seems like at least historically it has also been Syrah or been rosé. So um, that is always a, a, a legitimate choice for uh, a troublesome red, for sure. <laughs> How about you, Mike? Oh yeah, yeah. So I, and you know, I say maybe for a troublesome red, but also the um, you know, I think the the Rhone variety, the Rhone reds have. In, in a Syrah context, they just have this really kind of be beautiful hue and aroma to them. And there, there's not the whole kind of pyrazine factor like in some of the uh, red, red rice. So yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to do rosé from Syrah ne next year. Um, with the uh, Upper Shirley Mer Merved, um, if we're having a good season like we did in 2021, I wouldn't feel a need to kind of have that to not component, but if uh, you know, if I've got some doubts about how far we can um, ripen the Merved, I'll probably be like thinking, like, oh, let's let's get some of those panels of Tanat in with it. So yeah, yeah. So I think I think if if we're having a good season, it won't be necessary. But um, if 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 not, then for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially and this gets to to um, to Caitlin's question too that you know. Because at least at Upper Shirley, it seems like the Tanat and the Morved do tend to be ripe relatively close to one another. So even though you're not picking exactly the same day um, for the rest of the Tanat, you're it's it's close to ripe. You're not looking at that situation with you know one or two weeks difference in time where you have to think about either hanging something too long or picking something too early. Um, so. So in that case, yeah, having those good co-fermentation partners that are ripe about the same time on the same vineyard does give you the, the opportunity to do that for sure. Sorry, I would think if there were, you know, maybe up to a five day dis, di, difference, say, say if your Mer Merved came in or, or early and, and you're making the wine and they're like, hmm, needs a little something. And then, you know, if, if the Tanat picks coming in, I'd say as, as long as it's, you know, pre mid, midway fermentation, I, I, I feel confident in, in, in making the addition at that point and, and maybe even stretching out the original fermentation. So I've, I've definitely been in the situation where I've done that, that in the past. It, it is a little hard if you've got a full tea bin and then you kind of, you know, so you have to plan a little bit space wise if you're going to be adding, adding there. But if you're in a tank, for example, and you've got some space in the tank to, to, to add in, then you can do that. Um, um, okay, uh, so any other, well, I'm sorry, I wanted to circle back to Shai's question about using just skin. So Shai, we actually do have uh, three or four, I think, previous WRE experiments using skins instead of fruit for co-fermentation. Um, again, Michael did one with VNA last year, Emily did one a fair while ago with skins, um, and then Doug, Doug Fabioli did some in 2019. Um, both with uh, Vidal skins and sort of using, I think, pressed Merlot, I think going right. back into Jamerson. I thought, I thought, um, yeah, I thought, so we started to play with that a little bit. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, thought, I thought it was uh, with Doug uh, pressed to not skins going into Jamerson. It, you may, uh, was yeah, it yeah, yeah. either? I, I'll trust your memory better than mine on that. So, um, but but I, in Shai, I'm happy to send you the links for those particular reports so that you can see what the what the numbers were. I would say that that much like even the you know the published academic studies that we saw, we had basically kind of um, you know obviously if you're adding 
red back into a red, sometimes you get a little bit more of the red that you're adding back in just has more overall concentration of, of color. Um, I think we had a little bit of, of potential uh, like positive impact on color and tannin from one of the Viognier um, additions, but not each of them. So it seems uh, it's, it's possible, but it also has some inconsistency to it. Um, and, in, and in Bolton's paper, he even talks about like the potential for using skins rather than um, just using the whole grape to do that if you wanted to avoid the some of the just juice dilution of it. So it's, it's definitely a so, possibility, but again, you just never know ahead of time what it's gonna do. Right, and what I'm, so what I'm hearing is most of the experiments that we've done here in this, uh, with VWRE have been with pressed finished reds going back into the start of a fermentation, if that's pertaining to the question that I was asking, which is just red grapes pre-must, pre-fermentation being switched out of red, other grape, red grape juice, and just swapping, let's say, Cab Franc juice out and fermenting it on Cab Sauv skins, and then Cab, that same Cab Sauv juice swapping out and fermenting on Cab Franc skins. I know timing is very difficult to do. And if there's any kind of benefit, because I, all I can hear, or all I can think of is the logistical planning of that would be nightmarish. Uh, I guess the question is, is what would you be trying to, like, what would be the goal there is, would it be to just to, to sort of get the marriage of the flavor profiles? Marriage of the flavor profiles, and then also kind of see what, I mean, it, if we have underripe uh, Cab Franc, for example, instead of blending that out and instead of having to go through all the different analogic pro uh, products that we have to blend out MPs or kind of highlight other flavor profiles, can we then kind of ferment it on a different grape and increase, increase different flavors that way? Yeah, I guess the question would be, are you, are you, are you, you, because you have to, because it's essentially, it's a reciprocal swab, you're right. sort of sacrificing one for the other. Um, so it would be a question maybe of what those partners are. We have certainly not done that trial before, but if you're interested in playing with it, we can, we can talk. Um, could be interesting. We, you we do have talk. the tanks for it. So yeah, you, you that's, the tanks that's right. So, you know, there's that. But. Okay. Um, any other, oh, Sharon just wrote in, she's, that she agrees with Don's conclusion that the three three glasses blended together are are very pleasant, and I would I'm I'm guessing that that's about complexity, but I can see where the three um, put together could give some nice complexity. As soon as we get off the call, I'll try it with my leftover wine as well. So, um, so yeah. Okay, anything else uh, that we want to say about co-fermentation before we sign off for the day? Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for coming today and for sharing your thoughts and your impressions with us. Um, I, like I said, we will be sending an invitation for an in-person session um, very soon. So keep your eyes out for that. And we hope that you all um, will be able to join us and we'll be able to kind of do this in real life for, for the first time in a long time. So thanks so much. And we will see you next time.